so good morning everybody you are once again with the ihrs uh, dmdnb arithmia teaching program it's the first sunday of the month and usually at this time we gather to discuss something about arrhythmias and heart failure well predominantly arrhythmias because this is something that is uh, uh, less discussed primarily because i don't think every academic department or a dnb uh, uh, postgraduate has a staff electrophysiologist uh, uh, discussing the nitty gritties with him. So we don't intend to kind of supplement that possibility. In fact, we would like that more EPs are generated in the country and uh, they find positions in academic positions in as many cardiology programs around the country. But till that happens, we find our IHRS found it was a good job to stimulate interest and also help them in their exit exams eventually by what we discuss on this program. And thankfully, we have actually no dearth of uh, faculty uh, very willing to come on board with a particular theme and discuss it over, uh, say, uh, 90 minutes to maximum two hours and uh, keep every keep the postgraduates, postgraduates interested in arithmology. So, I wouldn't wish to stand much between you and today's academic program. And we have, uh, this time I have requested uh, Dr. Mukund Prabhu and his team from Manipal, essentially, to be the host faculty. And they, I think, have a number of uh, presentations lined up. I will leave it to him to explain what and how he's going to take forward this theme. But I think at the end of it, you will all have less fear for using antiarrhythmic drugs appropriately though. And uh, I think that should be a good outcome of this meeting. Now, I'm also equally thankful to the moderators and we have actually a next gen of the moderators. We have Dr. Debabrata Bera, who is already into practice for a long time in Kolkata. And he is a very, very meticulous analyzer of the ECGs and the electrograms and uh, always presenting at the meetings. And I'm sure he will uh, add to the value of today's discussion. Also, we have uh, Dr. Muthaya Subramanian, who is actually a very, very good next-gen EP that we have in the country. He publishes very, very fervently and is deeply interested uh, in being there at the academic meetings. I recently attended one by him. So I think uh, that should be a good enough launching and I'm going to invite Dr. Mukund Prabhu to uh, discuss uh, what he wants to in this uh, next uh, one and a half hour and also introduce his faculty and say who is going to teach us what. So Mukund, the floor is yours and we can get program rolling. Yeah, I'll start by thanking IHRS as well as Ashish sir, his unwavering commitment across all these months, every Sunday of the month, discussing arrhythmia topics to the PGs has been wonderful. We always used to uh, lack some EC, core ECG discussions during our training, especially our MD days. Uh, so this probably is a solution where we can have core discussion on dedicated focus discussions on arrhythmia. So the topic uh, chosen today are usually what I felt as less discussed topics. One is arrhythmia mechanisms. Many of us treat arrhythmias, deal with arrhythmias without uh, thoroughly knowing the mechanisms because uh, most of the time it's amidoron. Uh, that's the most popular antiarrhythmic uh, drugs probably in use apart from beta blockers. And uh, there are so many adverse effects of antiarrhythmic drug, drugs. How to wisely choose the drugs based on arrhythmia mechanism? What all to monitor while the patient is on antiarrhythmic drugs? What are the so-called pro-arrhythmic effects and how to be aware of them? Uh, all those will be discussed in uh, today's sessions. Uh, and finally, arrhythmia mechanisms, we generally don't include polymorphic VT. And it's usually brushed aside as a uh, wastebasket diagnosis. So if he had a VT, not even a polymorphic VT, we'll just get the information that he had a VT. So whenever we have a polymorphic VT, it's not just a polymorphic VT. There are so many things that we look, uh, the nuances of it, we have to address and uh, plan the treatment accordingly. So that also will be included as part of arrhythmia mechanism as well as, tre as treatment. So that will cover almost all arrhythmia mechanisms, treatment options available, and adverse effect. That's my plan. Uh, whatever is possible in one and a half, two hours, we'll do it. I thank Manish, who is my colleague in Mangalore, KMC Mangalore, and KMC Manipal. We work together. And because just two of us are there, we called our uh, all-time friend, Praveen Sikmar, who works in uh, Astar Kochi. He was very willing to uh, give the talk at a very short notice. So I thank all of them. And now we'll move to the first talk, probably, sir. Hello. 
Hello. I think Ashish sir is muted. So maybe there's some network issue. Mukun sir, you can start off. Yeah. We'll Thank start you. with the uh, first talk. Oh, without can, you can hear me, right? Yes, yes, sir, yes. Now I can hear okay, you. Okay, okay. So I think we can start with Praveen, no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Praveen, your slides and I think the audio is still some concern, but uh, that's fine. I think uh, we can, as long as the slides are displayed and displayed and the voice is good, we are good. Yeah, Praveen, can you share the screen? Shruti? Yes. Hello? Yes. Can you allow Praveen to share the screen and get the voice on and work over the video part? Uh, please try. Dr. Praveen, please try. You can. Uh, Praveen is having problem in uh, sharing his screen as well as using the audio. Can you give him a call and uh, sort it out? Okay. Can we, uh, skipping this, can we go to the next topic or it's better to go step by step? Maybe we can have maybe five minutes more. Yeah, if a couple of minutes it doesn't sort out, probably we'll... Yeah, then we'll think... Oh, I am unmuted. Am I audible? Yes, 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 Dr. Praveen. Very well, yeah. warm welcome. And if we can share your screen, we are eagerly waiting to hear yeah. you. Yeah, I'm sharing the screen. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, Dr. Praveen puts up his, yeah, we can see you now. Yeah, we can see your slides. Just for a brief yeah. introduction, yeah, Dr. Praveen is a senior electrophysiologist in Kochi and uh, he, he works in uh, Astra Med City Hospital. He has been trained uh, in India and abroad. Uh, we can get started because this is, I think, uh, the base of uh, arrhythmia as well as EP. Thank you. It's over to Dr. Praveen, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, sorry for the delay. I'll make it fast. So we are going to basic mechanism of cardiac arrhythmia. Basically, arrhythmia uh, mechanisms are uh, divided into enhanced automaticity, triggered activity, uh, and uh, disorders of impulse conduction. Disorders, these are disorders of impulse formation. Uh, cellularly, when, uh, when there is a disord disordered impulse formation, um, it could be either due to uh, the tissue uh, which uh, due to enhanced automaticity or a triggered activity which is triggered by either an enhanced automaticity. So uh, then the, dis the disorders of impulse conduction, which may be either block or a re-entry, which could be either my micro or a macro re-entry. Uh, either the disorders of impulse formation of or impulse uh, disorders of impulse conduction, any of these may trigger may act on a trigger and it may act on a substrate. Both trigger and substrate can have any of these basic uh, abnormality. And the problems with the trigger 
uh, which may activate a substrate to cause a uh, arrhythmia. This arrhythmia may be either an intermittent alteration in normal rhythm, uh, for example, like, or an isolated phenomenon like a VPC, or it may mask an underlying abnormality uh, in the rhythm, or it may uh, be just uh, manifesting just like an insustained or a sustained arrhythmia. So the cellularly, the uh, phases of depolarization or repolarization phases like two, three, or four may be abnormal in any of the cardiac arrhythmias. So there's an interplay of uh, right from cellular up to a manifestation of ECG. There is an uh, interplay of multiple factors which may uh, trigger any of the multitude of arrhythmias. Basically, the uh, abnormal uh, systolic depolarization on the ECG, like a delta wave, uh, which may indicate an abnormal conduction rather than an abnormal automaticity. Uh, or a ventricular tachycardia is another example of an abnormal systolic depolarization. Malignant abnormal diastolic depolarization may happen during the, re, the so-called repolarization phase. So there may be a diastolic depolarization like early repolarization, like epsilon waves of ARBC which happen during the uh, uh, diastole of the heart. That's a mechanical diastole, but here uh, uh, the, the diastolic depolarization is what is meant. And Brugada syndrome, long QT syndrome, uh, receptor mutation, and mid-diastolic potential of car. These are abnormal diastolic depolarizations. Some, so the test or manuals to determine mechanism of particular arrhythmia include a entrainment, which is a test to confirm re-entry as mechanism. We can note the initiation and termination of uh, tachycardia after pacing stimulus or spontaneous and response to overdrive pacing, demonstration of electrical activity, bridging diastole and fixed coupling interval. These may, or, uh, these may indicate the mechanism of arrhythmia. Uh, enhanced automaticity. Uh, for example, it is due to inappropriate discharge from an abnormal pacemaker site. It may occur from latent pacemakers like atria, like in atria, coronary sinus, pulmonary veins, AV valves, portion of AV junctions, hypertensive system, ventricular muscle, uh, left or right outflow tracts or valves. In normal state, overdrive suppress, uh, suppression, uh, may, uh, the overdrive suppress, it is overdrive suppressed by the more rapid firing sinus node. When tachycardia happens when the rate of this pacemaker exceeds the sinus rate. It can uh, enhance automaticity can open occur, uh, occur in slow heart rate when there is a block between sinus node and the pacemaker site, which is an entrance block, and the latent pacemaker starts discharging at its own rate, causing arrhythmia. And characteristic of enhanced automaticity is abrupt onset, rate variation or rate undulation, overdrive suppression and resumption when overdrive is removed. This is generally they are resistant to DC cardioversion or antiarrhythmics. Uh, there can be entry or exit blocks. Focal automaticity is usually amenable to ablation and often ablation is curative and diffuse enhanced automaticity is very resistant to any form of treatment. Usually ablation or drugs are may return ineffective. And clinical examples of common clinical examples of enhanced automaticity are focal automatic atrial tachycardia, multifocal atrial tachycardia, inappropriate sinus tachycardia, junctional ectopic tachycardia, uh, for example, in children or post ablation, uh, post AVNRD ablation. Pulmonary vein focal automatic tachycardia manifesting on ECG as paroxysmal AF. This is a focal LA tachy where you can uh, then overdrive suppression is a characteristic of automatic tachycardia. You can see that once the overdrive suppression is stopped, immediately the, there is a uh, VAV response uh, continuing. Uh, then the tachycardia continues over the, after the overdrive stimulus is gone. Uh, the, uh, then differential diagnosis of a auto enhanced automaticity is triggered activity, sometimes micro re-entry, triggered activity or a micro re-entry. Here, you can see that there are abnormal diastolic potentials, which may indicate a triggered activity as a mechanism of this uh, mapped focal. The so uh, It appears focal on mapping, but I, I, I actual mechanism might be triggered activity or a micro re-entry. Adenosine may also indicate the mechanism of atrial uh, tachycardia, focal AT. Uh, uh, so, uh, so if a focal uh, in a focal automatic tachycardia, usual response is a partial suppression with adenosine. While, while in a triggered activity, usually it terminates with adenosine. And uh, in micro reentry, you can often demonstrate an in local entrainment. There are multiple automatic tissues. So automatic tissues uh, are uh, there are particular areas in the heart where there is there can be enhanced automaticity, uh, like in HRA, LRA, crista area or coronary sinus ostia area, all ostia of pulmonary veins, LA appendage area, martial vein area, 
so there are areas from uh, particular areas in ventricles there are uh, similarly there are particular areas where you can get uh, slow diastolic depolarization causing enhanced automaticity like uh, papillary muscles uh, uh, rvot ectopics uh, then uh, posterior mitral annular vt low lvot focal vt these are examples of automatic vt from the ventricle parasystole is also a form of enhanced automaticity so there are multiple multitude of areas in ventricle specified areas in ventricle where there can be enhanced automaticity enhanced automaticity may also happen in a structural heart disease and uh, so either in a idiopathic heart or a structural heart disease uh, now coming to triggered activity automaticity is the property of a single fiber to initiate impulse spontaneously without prior stimulation and electrical uh, questions do not occur so um, the activity goes on while in a triggered activity pacemaker activity results in uh, uh, that results consequent to preceding impulse so there should be either a normal activity or an abnormal enhanced activity can trigger a second impulse that is called as a triggered activity that changes triggers another uh, cardiac activity which is called as triggered activity so uh, uh, electrical questions uh, will not occur in a triggered activity after which uh, after that impulse is gone uh, that uh, uh, the stimulus is gone the triggered activity may not sustain even though triggered activity may uh, sustain due to a stimulation of a reentry subsequent reentry Examples are early uh, early after de depolarization. This occurs before full repolarization of the fiber, um, phase two or phase three of action potential, while delayed act after re de depolarization occurs after completion of repolarization. Characteristic of triggered activity are uh, uh, usual characteristics are intermittent, they are mostly of intermittent nature uh, because it cannot be sustained without an initial stimulus. They are either triggered by a normal sinus beat or an ectopic beat. There is consistent relations with its trigger, even if it is in, intermittent, and resistance to DC cardioversion or antiarrhythmic agents, and entry or exit block may be manifest in a triggered activity also. So uh, examples of early after uh, EADs, phase two EADs are like epsilon waves, long QT syndromes, where M cells are cause uh, heterogeneity in the myocardium, causing substrate for reentry. And sympathetic stimulation, especially left stellate leg ganglion, increases the EAD while short coupling intervals and rapid rates usually suppress uh, early after, after depolarization, phase two or phase three. While uh, exam classic examples of delayed after depolarization are drug induced or digitalis induced, uh, then Raynard re receptor mutations. Some types of RVOT, VT, and pulmonary vein 4K for atrial fibrillation are also actually delayed after depolarization. Usually, short couple pacing and rapid race increases the amplitude, uh, but sh and shorten the cycle length of post pacing. And this is called an overdrive accident. This is a character of delayed up after depolarization. Typical examples of early after uh, uh, triggered activity VPCs are like or uh, you can see RVOT v VPCs triggered by a normal sinus rhythm. On the right side, you can see a, uh, a VPC which is triggered by an ectopic. So, uh, first one is the trigger for the second one. So uh, usually this produces group beating couplets and triplets, which you can see in my, uh, normal halters. Sometimes um, these VPCs may become malignant. Uh, a short couple VPT, VPCs are usually dangerous um, than a non uh, long couple VPC. Late couple VPCs may become dangerous if there is a uh, if there are underlying substrate like uh, prolonged QT, which which is an added substrate. So uh, this can cause malignant arrhythmias. Uh, sometimes triggered activity may induce a re-entry. So the second mechanism of arrhythmia is a re-entry. The triggered activity in initiates a re-entry like AVNRT. Some of the clinical examples, uh, as I told, are RVOT, ectopics, pulmonary vein, tachycardias are re-entry. General characteristics of a re-entry are in, usually they are intermittent or sustained. Uh, triggered either by a normal sinus beat or an ectopic beat. Once started, it will continue to run, producing either an ill-sustained or a sustained tachycardia. Tachycardia can be reset or continually continually reset. That maneuver is called entra entrainment. And uh, if you note the post pacing interval minus tachycardia cycling, that gives an idea of electrical distance between pacing site and the active circuit. They are most most easily treated by drugs or DC cardioversion, and they are more amenable to ablation. Entrainment is a classic feature of reentry. What it indicates is suppose you pace from this site. It takes some time to reach the circuit. It engages the excitatory gap. The green part is called as the excitatory gap. This may, uh, if it's done for a single beat, if it catches the impulse, catches the excitatory gap, 
then it produces a single reset. Um, it just resets. What happens is you can note that the interval changes for a single beat, for the single applied beat. That means it has caught the excitatory gap and engaged the circuit of the tachycardia. Once you stop it, the tachycardia resumes. That is a character of entrainment. That is the difference between an entrainment and a termination of a tachy. So once the, uh, uh, you remove the stimulus, the tachycardia continues with the excitatory gap also rotating. So um, uh, that is a single reset. When you do it continuously, this maneuver is called as an entrainment. So even after re releasing the entrainment stimulus, the tachycardia continues without terminating the tachycardia. So that confirms the en entrainment. If you measure this interval um, and the previous uh, tachycardia interval, it will be the same. And in between, while you are pacing, it drives to the pacing cycle length. And when you release it, you note the features to know the, uh, for example, you note the post pacing interval minus tachycardia cycle length. That distance indicates this uh, distance from the pacing circuit from the pacing catheter to the circuit. That is very useful in multiple arrhythmias to know whether your catheter is very near your uh, active circuit or not. For example, in this uh, uh, tachycardia, it's a flutter. It's tachycardia, you can, uh, if you pace from this side, if you get a pace PPM minus TCL of 30, and from this side, if you are pacing uh, and uh, you get a PPM minus TCL of 50, then you know that your pacing catheter, here, this part is nearer the active part of the circuit. So that is the implication of entrainment in re-entry circuits. You know whether you are very near the tachycardia circuit. Common clinical examples of re-entry arrhythmias are sinus node re-entry, flutter, atrial fibrillation, AV node re-entrant tachycardia, AV re-entrant tachycardia mediated by a Kens pathway, or scar ventricular tachycardia or flutters. Uh, this is a map of uh, so, uh, this. This are multiple arrhythmias, and even a scar BT, the re-entry and entrainment mapping may help you identify the true circuit where you can ablate point wise. Brugada is a uh, phase two re-entry. And another type of uh, thing is blocks. Uh, for example, uh, uh, black, this is a case of a bradycardia dependent block, uh, where the bradycardia induces the uh, a temporary left bundle branch block. This is another form of conduction abnormality that you may see. So sometimes higher rate may produce a bundle branch block, uh, bundle branch block, which is a rate dependent block. Decremental conduction is another form of rate dependent block, where when you continually pace, you can see that a particular uh, tissue's refractory period is slowly prolonged, producing a decremental conduction. A normal AV node uh, demonstrate decremental conduction. Uh, Mahem's pathways, uh, abnormal pathways like Mahem pathway also may demonstrate. Why do we actually know the mechanism of arrhythmia based me maze mechanism? It's also for uh, drug management. Like this is a classic Vaughan William classification. While Sicilian gambit is a new change of strategy to uh, where we have to note the mechanism of arrhythmia and based on that you need to treat the uh, tachycardias or uh, or the arrhythmias. So that uh, the Sicilian gambit system indicates a shift to active clinical electrophysiology based classification based on mechanism of arrhythmia rather than the action potential based theoretical classification system. That is why Sicilian gambit system or uh, the that is the change is important. The conclusion is basic mechanism of enhanced automaticity, triggered activity and re-entry may act on a trigger and substrate and both jointly deciding the nature of different arrhythmias. Knowledge of mechanism of each arrhythmia is crucial for bedside clinical decision making, decision -making and to plan, uh, plan uh, long-term curative measures. Anti-arrhythmic choice is to be guided by mechanism of arrhythmia and knowledge of cellular mechanism of drug. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Praveen, for uh, such an insightful uh, talk. Uh, we also do understand that this is at least a an one and a half hour topic to present. And asking you to present in 12 minutes is uh, uh, too much of over expectation. But uh, as always, you have done a splendid job. Uh, is there any uh, question from the audience? Then otherwise, we can have a brief discussion among ourselves. Uh, I think uh, Lokanwala sir wants to. Uh, give his comments he has raised a hand so if we can have his valuable comments please i think uh okay maybe sir has... can you get the audience uh from the audience dr lokhandwala would be able to speak he has joined as panelists okay i've been i've been unmuted 
can you hear me yes sir yes, yes. sir good morning sir so uh, so deba somewhere along the line you know we all over the years we have said uh, re entry triggered activity and automaticity and many times about i want to make a couple of comments is that it is not very clear cut in a particular arrhythmia if you have a classical re entry like av nodal or av rt you can say it's re entry for example many atrial arrhythmias you really can't determine the mechanism in no. that context this this long standing belief that termination with adenosine means triggered activity i think is wrong and in fact we have even published this and we have shown uh, folk uh, micro reentrant atrial tachycardia as terminating with adenosine so no. similarly in arvc traditional thinking has been that the ventricular tachycardias are because of reentry but the epsilon waves are because of triggered activity that's what was said that's what i heard today for the first time so i think that some of these are i mean we should understand for our understanding purposes it's okay but many times in clinical practice we there are many arrhythmias which we cannot exactly define the mechanism that's what i wanted to say yeah yes these are obviously models to understand arrhythmogenesis and not uniformly Uh, correct in every clinical situation. For example, a re-entry is said to be a product of wave length into a conduction velocity, but that assumes as if the re-entry circuit is in single plane, and obviously, uh, and it's circular. Whereas the re-entry is not necessarily always a circle, and it uh, traverses uh, different uh, levels of the myocardium, as in a ventricular tachycardia. So I think they are simply models to understand. Uh, how arrhythmogenesis happens and as you rightly say there are uh, they will not perfectly fit every time into every clinical uh, scenario I completely agree sir so so there are three relevant uh, questions in the q and a box if we can briefly answer yeah, uh, sure you can take them up yeah. so, uh, the first question from dr viresh is uh, oh, i think oh okay that has come into the answered one but still i think it's a very relevant one so is there any way to differentiate between arrhythmias of ead that is early after depolarization versus delayed after depolarization based on ecg if uh, dr sri kumar or dr mukund you can take up the question because i think this is relevant always it's not possible but how we can do it actually uh, i replied that uh, question pri privately i will repeat the answer here it's a very relevant question and it's not very easy and uh, sure. perfectly possible to do that either probably the phase 3 uh, out early after depolarization fall on the phase 3 of the action potential as the name implies so you expect some notching or if the notching is up to the threshold mark an ectopic happening near the peak of the t wave that's where you expect your phase 3 of the action potential to be whereas phase 4 happens in later phase of the action potential towards the end of uh, uh, repolarization so such activity will be reflected towards the descending limb or end of the t wave that's how i yeah. look at it maybe there are other techniques also True. So, uh, if I can uh, simplify, I don't know whether right or wrong. Uh, yes, sir, and our sir is there. So, uh, usually the phase three or the EAD early after depolarization are exactly on top of the T waves. So, usual R on T phenomena what we find, uh, especially in long QT or some other um, uh, torsades, they are actually EAD early after depolarization. Whereas the DAD or the delayed after depolarization, they generally do, do not fall there little as you said and the later part of the t or end of the t wave one of the classical example is cpvt where the pvc comes and the vf triggers so it depends on where the pvc comes uh, if we if if i am right just yes sir's comment or never sir's comment then we'll go to the next question clinically speaking i think you are right the more early coupled would be a phase 3 uh, or a uh, uh, correct uh, depolarization and more late coupled would be kind of a delayed after depolarization. Yeah. Yes, anything? There are two more questions. So, why arrhythmia initiated by triggered activity or enhanced automat automaticity are not very responsive to cardioversion or drugs and how they are best treated? Dr. Okay. Sikumar or Dr. Prabhu? Yeah. Want to basically, basically, because uh, in a triggered activity, the, uh, you may modify it 
uh, first of all, it will be not very sustained and triggered activity. It just uh, usually they are isolated mm -hmm. phenomena. They are responsible for isolated uh, difference or phenomena. But the problem with triggered activity, they may trigger another re-entry or in an abnormal substrate. That is the most malignant part of it. One thing, triggered activity may not respond to uh, on a macroscopic scale, it might respond to that area. If you ablate, it may go that area, if that abnormal area. But usually in a triggered activity, suppose if it's a diffuse phenomenon, like all cells are affected, then uh, you don't expect it to change anything by ablation, by a focal ablation or a structural uh, modification. So that has to be treated either way medically. So that's why most of the triggered activity are either medical or genetic. So they are a diffuse phenomenon. They, that uh, changing the substrate is, involves changing the cellular, uh, uh, you have to modify it cellularly rather uh, than structurally. So probably that's why triggered activity cannot be easily modified. Any other opinions? From I agree with this. And uh, uh, I think uh, trigger activity and automaticity are some way very similar. So similarly, automaticity also uh, coming to his pertinent question that cardioversion often is fails to uh, cardio I mean, successfully uh, terminate automatic tachycardia like a, a automatic VT from my inflammation or somewhere or even automatic atrial tachycardia. It can just briefly suppress it and uh, again that focus starts firing. Uh, yeah, I so have a couple of more questions, but in the interest of time, we have to move on. So yeah. we'll with each of the questions, we'll uh, type it and uh, post it in the uh, this thing, uh, post it in the group. So uh, I'll hand over the mic to Dr. Muthaya uh, to introduce the new uh, next speaker, please. Thank you, sir. So I think next speaker doesn't need any introduction, Dr. Manish. Um, so we've uh, we, during our training, we've been listening to uh, Manish sir and Mukun sir present a lot of topics and they're always very good. So I'll hand it over to Manish sir for this topic. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Sir. Yeah. Good morning. And thank you for this opportunity. So my topic is on antiarrhythmic drugs. So I'll keep it simple first. And second, I'll not go into the conventional pharmacology, like what we studied in second year MBBS. Rather, I'll talk, uh, I'll discuss antiarrhythmic drugs from a clinical standpoint as to how to select an antiarrhythmic drug for a particular arrhythmia and with relevant uh, pharmacology. So before selecting an antiarrhythmic drug, it is prudent to understand two important aspects of the arrhythmia. Second, first is what is the mechanism of arrhythmia, which Praveen already dealt with. And second, what is the vulnerable parameter that can be targeted by the antiarrhythmic? So we need to know two things. What is the mechanism, if possible, like, like what the panelists discussed, it's not always uh, you know, possible to identify or clearly define the mechanism. Or more than one mechanism may be acting in an arrhythmia. But uh, if we can understand or if we can delineate what could be the possible mechanism, and then we can decide what is the vulnerable parameter, then we can select the appropriate drug for that. So the original classification of antiarrhythmic drugs, which is still in mm -hmm. use, you know, the wagon willem classification, uh, is more theoretical and has its limitations. But what is more interesting is the Sicilian gambit approach. The gambit approach is like chess, is, is actually gambit is a move in chess. So, you know, it's like uh, you see your opponent, you see what is the weak link in him or see his moves and decide on your move. The same thing applies to arrhythmias also. You see the arrhythmia, you decide, you know, try to fail, you know, find out what is the possible mechanism of the arrhythmia and decide the drug which could act on the vulnerable parameter. So, taking away, continuing from what Praveen said, you know, in uh, enhanced automaticity, it's actually increased, you know, depolarization, phase four depolarization. So, or you know, so that what the vulnerable parameter here would be the phase four depolarization. So, ideally, in these cases, you would use a beta blockade to suppress the phase four depolarization or reduce automaticity, or you would also use something like an evapradin, which acts on the funny funny current, reduce the automaticity. Coming to triggered activity, again, there's early after depolarization and delayed after depolarization. So, early after depolarization, like what was described earlier, is uh, you know EAD is occurring in the phase three. So the in more characteristic part of early after depolarizations are usually they're associated with QT prolongation or prolongation of the action potential duration. So typically this prolongation of the action potential duration, which causes these uh, EADs. And sometimes you can have these things without significant prolongation of the action potential duration also. So what is coming into picture is the new understanding on the late sodium channels, which act on phase one, and they can increase the cytosolic calcium causing EADs, uh, you know, even without, uh, you know, significantly prolonging the action potential duration. So as was discussed, why is it difficult to suppress these EADs is because if you have QT prolongation, like in an LQT or something like that causing the EADs, you can use drugs to reduce the QT interval. 
like mexilitine or you know lignocaine in an ACS situation and which would in turn suppress the EADs. Basically, the idea is to suppress the EADs. But many a times, you know, it's difficult to suppress the EADs per se, you know, because you have to reduce the automaticity of this firing ectopics, which is a challenging task. So we do not have many drugs which act on reducing the automaticity of these ectopics. Like, for example, in ACS, like the Perkinji triggered VTs, now they're trying uh, quinidine, which can, uh, you know, which can probably act on these EADs and reduce automaticity. We ourselves have tried with the phenytoin sodium and now are trying with the uh, quinine, you know, to reduce these EADs with, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, you know, reasonable uh, success. So, but that's the challenge in treating EADs. DADs, on the other hand, occur late after the, you know, what action potential is over and they don't pose so much of an, you know, uh, what uh, tossards risk because they happen during diastole. And these are because of diastolic calcium currents. So influx of diastolic calcium currents. So both of these are calcium related arrhythmias. And, uh, you know, the difference is this happens in phase three and this happens in phase four. And this is because of diastolic calcium currents. Again, traditionally, you would use a calcium channel blocker to address DADs, like in an RBOT, BT, or anything like that. But you know, of late, we have we are we are understanding that many other drugs have got additional effects, like flaconide, which is which is considered to be a one A drug. You know, sodium channel blocker also also reduces diastolic calcium currents. That's why it's useful in conditions like you know. Uh, you know, uh, what uh, anderson tavel syndrome and uh, RVOTVTs and also in uh, CPUT, et cetera, because it reduces the diastolic calcium overload. So it's easier to address DADs rather than EADs because you have drugs which can probably target phase four. Now coming to re-entry. So as we all know, in re-entry, there are two anatomical circuits or maybe functional circuits or substrate like, you know, with the unidirectional block and there's a re-entry happening. Now, in uh, so I forgot to say, in... Uh, in uh, the vulnerable parameter in uh, in uh, triggered activity in EAD would be to reduce the action potential duration. In an EAD, you would never want to choose a drug which, which increases the action potential duration because you're only going to make it worse. Whereas in uh, DADs, you would rather reduce the cytosolic calcium by reducing the diastolic calcium waves by using a calcium channel blocker or by using something like a flaconide. Whereas in uh, re-entry circuit, what we need to target is the excitable gap. That is the gap between the leading edge and the trailing edge or the depolarizing wavefront and the repolarizing wavefront. So this is what keeps the reentry circuit going on. You know, as the depolarization continues, the you know the area behind it continues to repolarize, making it excitable. So if you reduce this, we target this excitable gap by some way. The two ways of targeting the excitable gap is either you reduce the conduction velocity to a greater extent, or you increase the refractiveness of this tissue. If you if you make this tissue re re refractory, the leading edge when it comes, it will find the tissue refractory and the circuit will terminate. So the vulnerable parameter in an excitable gap would be uh, the in uh, in a reentry would be the excitable gap, and the way to target it would be to target the conduction velocity or increase the refractive uh, refractive period of the tissues. In automaticity, the vulnerable parameter is phase four depolarization, so or phase zero. So you you would ideally use beta blockade or evabradin. In triggered activity, you know the vulnerable parameter, as I said, would be action potential duration. So try to reduce the action potential duration and try to use drugs which reduce firing of the EADs. In DADs, it is intracellular calcium overload. So, you know, on this basis, if you go back to the Morgan Williams classification, so, you know, there are four groups. There are actually many other classes, class zero, class five, six, seven. Many of them are yet under development, class five, six, seven drugs. The class one, although there are, you know, there is some homogeneity among the classes, like class one drugs act on ion channels. They're all sodium channel blockers. They could be having other effects also. Class two drugs are receptor blockers. They act on beta adrenergic receptors. Class three drugs have a common pro property. They prolong the refractive period by virtue of prolonging the action potential duration. So, you know, they are prolonged uh, drugs that prolong the refractive period. And class four drugs are, again, ion channel blockers that act on the calcium channels. So if you look at the action potential, very basic form. So phase zero is, uh, you know, phase one is because of rapid sodium entry into the cell. And, uh, phase, you know, the, here you have the I2 channels, which cause early repolarization. And then you have the phase two because of calcium influx. And then you have the phase three predominantly because of continued repolarization or the exit of potassium from the cells because of IKS and IKR. So typically sodium channel blockers act on uh, phase zero of the action potential duration. They prolong, they decrease the slope of phase zero. They also have another effect. So, you know, they also can prolong the action potential duration by virtue of their potassium channel actions. So they not they they act on slowing the conduction velocity and also prolonging the action potential duration. 
So if you see the co clinical correlates or the ECG correlates of these two action, a phase zero action that is slowing of the uh, you know conduction velocity would manifest as a QRS prolongation. So that's one way of monitoring sodium channel blockers because you know if they tend to slow down phase zero to a greater extent or when when you know levels move from uh, you know therapeutic to toxic, you'll probably find a prolongation of the QRS duration. Same things uh, you know sodium channel blockers, especially class one and one C drugs, have a pro action potential prolongation uh, action which can manifest in the ECG as a QT prolongation. So these two parameters on the ECG would be good ways to monitor antiarrhythmics, especially class one and class three antiarrhythmics. Class three antiarrhythmics predominantly act on phase three. They prolong the action potential duration and thereby increase refractiveness. So by virtue of prolonging the uh, you know action potential duration, they do translate to prolonged QT uh, QT uh, interval. So again, based on the variable effect on the two properties of sodium channel blockers, that is the conduction velocity and the uh, prolongation of repolarization, there are three subclasses, class 1A, 1B, and 1C. Class 1A prolong the action potential duration to a greater extent, so they increase refractiveness. But at the same time, as a byproduct, they increase QT, QT interval also. They have modest effect on the conduction velocity, so they don't cause so much of QRS prolongation. Class 1C drugs have maximum uh, action on phase zero. That is, they slow down the conduction to a greater extent. And that's why you see a drug like flaconide causing QRS prolongation on the ECG, and we need to be careful about that. They have, you know, a neutral or slightly more prolonged uh, uh, prolonged effect on the uh, what action potential duration. Flaconide also has got potential channel blocking activity, and that's why there is some amount, it, it can cause some phase three like actions also. Class 1B drugs are QT neutral. Very important to understand something like lignocaine or mixolytine do not prolong the uh, what action potential duration and do not cause uh, what uh, increased refractiveness. They have a modest effect on the uh, what uh, rate of rise of phase zero. So the phase th the class three drugs, as I said, and by increasing the refractive rate and and basically by prolonging the action potential uh, duration. And the uh, side effect of this would be QT prolongation. So the side effect or the you know therapeutic effect rather of uh, of one A drugs would be QRS prolongation and maybe QT prolongation in class one A and class one C drugs, not in class one B. So now that we know the basic classes of antiarrhythmic drugs and what how do they act electrophysiologically, so we can see that you know where they would be useful in which kind of arrhythmia. Suppose we know the mechanism of arrhythmia, where it would probably be useful. So like uh, quinidine, procainamide, and uh, the disoprenamide, all, all the sodium channel blockers for that matter, as I told you, they have two basic effects. They reduce conduction velocity, they increase refractiveness. Now, if you see the arrhythmia mechanisms, so conduction velocity and refractive period, refractiveness, are very important you know, mechanism which can be targeted in re-entry circuits. So going by that logic, you know, uh, the sodium channel blockers would be very useful for re-entry circuits, especially the ventricular re-entry circuits, but it's not always the case. So we don't use laconide for ventricular re-entry arrhythmias because laconide so, has shown to be pro-arrhythmic in many trials, you know, especially it can, I mean, many of these anti-arrhythmic drugs can also depress the, you know, contractility and uh, can worsen, you know, what uh, uh, pro-arrhythmia. So uh, although Theoretically, it makes sense to use a sodium channel blocker for re-entry arrhythmia in the ventricles. Many of the times we don't use them in the this one, oh, except okay. for maybe lignocaine. Yeah. lignocaine. Uh, so, and another reason for that is another property of sodium channel blockers is that it is in it is use dependent. So it makes sense to use many of these drugs in an atrial arrhythmia, like an atrial flutter of fibrillation, wherein the atria are depolarizing at a much faster rate than the ventricle. So because of the use dependent action, these would be more preferably acting on the atrial myocardium rather than the ventricle myocardium. Secondly, many of the sodium channels, the atrial sodium channels are slightly different from the ventricular sodium channels. They have a slightly next and uh, less negative uh, resting membrane potential. And some of these drugs preferentially work on the atria. So we were yet to find drugs which act only on the atria. That would be wonderful for atrial arrhythmias. So many of these drugs like disoperamide and flaconide are predominantly used for atrial reentrant arrhythmias. Uh, you know, and atrial tachycardias, and not for ventricular arrhythmias. For ventricular arrhythmias, we do use IV lignocaine, especially in acute ACS, acute uh, ACS for reentrant arrhythmias. Okay, the beta blockers, as I said, would be wonderful for automaticity arrhythmias, where the mechanism would be automaticity. Amidrone, the main action of amidrone is a class three agent, and that increases refractiveness. So again, refractiveness would mean excitable gap. So they would be wonderful for arrhythmias involved in reentry. Calcium channel blockers, again would be excellent drugs of choice for triggered activity. So when you have a triggered arrhythmia, like and you know, including some PV tax or some REOT in or tachycardias, you would use a uh, calcium channel blocker. So this is how wherein you know you can, if you know the mechanism of the arrhythmia, you'd probably select an anti-arrhythmic drug based on its uh, electrophysiological effects.
So now we'll just go with a few examples about selecting an anti-arrhythmia drug. So this is the first example. As you can see, this is uh, you know an outflow tract to ventricular tachycardia coming from the right ventricular outflow tract. This is typical of the triggered nature, what I described earlier, coming in bursts. So and the underlying QRS looks normal. So it's most likely to be an structure in normal heart to ventricular tachycardia. So we know that these arrhythmias are triggered arrhythmias. So the drug of choice here would be, you know, and we know that the vulnerable parameter would be the cytosolic calcium. So you'd use a calcium channel blocker in this case uh, to terminate or to for as maintenance therapy for this case. And as I said, you know, the other drugs which can target cytosolic calcium are flaconide. So you may know many times we use flaconide also for these arrhythmias. The second ECG is that of a VT. If you look at this, this is a typical monomorphic VT. This is a scar-related VT. You have QS in V5, V6 saying probably this is an old antrobol MI, and the morphology of the VT looks like an apical inferoceptal VT. So this is a scar-related VT. Now, in a, this is so we know that the mechanism in a scar-related VT is likely to be a re-entry. And the vulnerable parameter in a re-entry that we need to target is either we need to slow the conduction drastically or we need to increase the refractiveness. So the drugs of choice that we are thinking here would be a sodium channel blocker or a class three agent. Now the sodium channel blocker, if you if you think, you know, in India, what is available in intravenous form is lignocaine. Now lignocaine might not be very effective in a scar. It's more effective in an ACA situation and I'll tell you why. So, you know, we are not left with many other intravenous sodium channel blockers. So the obvious choice here would be, or the default choice for that matter, would be a class three agent which increases the refractiveness and thereby reduces the excitable gap. So in this case, it would make sense to use IV amiodarone uh, you know, to terminate this ventricular tachycardia if it's hemodynamically stable. If it's unstable, you'd obviously cardiovert. Now, coming to the next example of a VT, this is another, you can see this is a short coupled uh, ectopic triggering of a ventricular, uh, you know, VT. The coupling interval is around 320 milliseconds. And you also notice that there's an there's, there's probably a substrate of underlying ischemia. There's Q waves in V4, you don't see Q in the precordial leads. And you also see some ST depression in the lateral leads. So this is probably ischemia triggering of, uh, you know, EAD, short coupled ectopic triggering of ventricular tachycardias. So, you know, when, you know, so we know that this is probably an EAD related arrhythmia because of an underlying ischemia. And we know that the culprit in EAD is action potential duration and a vulnerable parameter would be that. And we need something to reduce the action potential duration or we need something to suppress this ectopic. Now, one thing we should not use here is a class three agent because class three agents are going to prolong the action potential duration. So something like amidon, the default drug, are only going to make this worse because they're going to prolong the action potential duration and make this more. You'd probably get an R1T and a VF, which uh, you know you'd get a VF. So what you need is a QT neutral drug or a drug that reduces the QT interval. So in this case, especially in an ischemic setting, it would make sense to use lignocaine. Another reason why lignocaine works very well in ischemic setting is one, it's a weak base. So the acidic ischemic medium makes it more potent. That's one thing, you know, because, the, you know, and the second reason is lignocaine also has action on the late sodium current. That is, you know, in nearing the phase one, the late sodium current, it reduces this late sodium current. It is believed that many of these EADs are because of this late sodium currents, which allow a cytosolic calcium and which in turn trigger this EAD. So maybe lignocaine acts by that also. So, you know, so in this case, the primary objective would be to revascularize. And if you were to use an anti arrhythmic drug, I would probably, probably use uh, lignocaine. And if the patient is stable and still has occasional ectopics, I would add on mexilithin. So this is a very difficult substrate to treat. You know, these are the conditions, this is the condition which results in VT storm, recurrent VTs. Many of the times they have to be taken up for ablation. But of late, other drugs that have been tried and which have been successful in suppressing these ectopics, as I mentioned, are quinidine. And, you know, we found some success with phenytoin and with quinine. Now coming to the last ECG, this is an atrial flutter. So this again is an atrial flutter. It's a re-entry tachycardia, but this time in the atria. So, you know, as we know, it's a re-entry. We need to target either the conduction velocity or the refractory period. So the obvious choice as, as of now would be, you know, class three agent, which prolongs the refractory period. So today we use IV amidron or we use ebutylide. Ibutinide is an intravenous class three agent, which you know acts, uh, you know acts by increasing the refractive rate and has got a you know reasonable success in terminating atrial arrhythmias. But one thing is, you know, these class three agents are going to cause uh, action potential duration prolongation. So that's an undesirable side effect. It would be, as I said, it would be really nice to get uh, you know selective sodium channel blockers which act only on the atria. There are many under evaluation. Cornacolant and many others, which act preferably on the atria only, because you know the atrial uh, sodium channels are different from the ventricle. If you have something like that, 
you wouldn't have the under undesirable side effects of ventricular arrhythmias when treating an atrial arrhythmia. So right now, when you give EB to light, because of its class 3 action, you have to monitor the QT interval and you have to watch out for NSVTs and R on T. Thankfully, EB to light has got very short duration of action and it's got rapid redistribution, just like lignocaine, EB to light gets redistributed very early. And you know, although the half-life of EB to light is around eight hours, the QT prolongation action would remain only for around one hour because by that time it is redistributed and the cardiac specific effects of EB to light are off. Off. So, you know, but this is where a lot of research is going on into atrial specific sodium channel blockers, you know, targeting, uh, you know, low, late sodium channels in the atria and also targeting uh, ultra rapid potassium channels in the atria. And so that we have, we have no undesirable ventricular side effects when you're treating a very common arrhythmia like an atrial fibrillation or an atrial flutter. So now that we know how to choose an antiarrhythmic drug for a particular uh, situation, I just like to rush through some of the basic uh, by, by, you know, pharmacokinetics in the next few minutes. Pharmacokinetics of antiarrhythmic drugs is very, very important, you know, with the reason being because they work on a very narrow therapeutic window. So the therapeutic dose today might be a toxic dose tomorrow if the patient's hemodynamics or the general condition of the uh, you know, patient changes. And we need to watch out for them and be very, very careful. So if you look, most of this, uh, you know, what uh, some of these uh, antiarrhythmic drugs are given intravenous because they have very high first pass metabolism. Take, for example, lignocaine. It has got very high first pass metabolism. So that doesn't make sense to give it orally and has to be given uh, intravenously. Same with ibutlide, et cetera. Majority of the antiarrhythmic drugs are thankfully removed by the uh, hepatic system. So they're safe in, in, you know, even in, in renal disease. So take, for example, amiodarone has got complete uh, hepatic metabolism and is excreted by the biliary tree. And half-life ranging from three weeks to 15 weeks, which can go up to 100 days. That's just the half-life. So, you know, but the good part of it is because it's not excreted renally, you can use it in renal dysfunction. And uh, similarly with uh, many other drugs, flaconide, for example, uh, you know, is excreted 25% by the renals. And we need to be careful in patients with CKD, we need to reduce the dose. And uh, mexilitine has got hepatic uh, clearance. So again, can be safe in uh, renal, uh, renal dysfunction. And the sotlol is, uh, you know, hydrophilic uh, beta blockade. You know, interesting thing about Sotlol is uh, it has a dose-dependent action. It acts as a beta blocker at lower doses and as a class 3 agent at, at higher doses. And uh, it is excreted by the kidneys. So we need to be careful in patients with uh, renal dysfunction. So my, many other drugs have got pure hepatic metabolism. Another important thing about, uh, you know, antiretic drugs we need to know is the protein binding. Many of these drugs are highly protein-bound, and that is the place where you can have drug-drug interactions, especially when patients, you know, cardiac, cardiac patients are taking multiple medications. For example, you know, amidrone. Amidrone is extremely protein-bound and it can displace, you know, see, the, the potential or the clinical effect of the drug is not because of the protein-bound. It is the amount of the drug that is free, not bound to protein. So when, uh, when you know, when you have two drugs competing for the same protein, one drug can displace the other. For example, amidrone can easily displace warfarin from its protein bind sites and increase the therapeutic level of Almost warfarin. There. You know. Almost so sorry, warfarin... Sorry, sorry, sir, just a couple minutes, sir. It's... Yeah, sure, sure. I'm about to close. So warfarin would become more potent when combining with the uh, amidrone. Same thing with Novax also. Novax and amidrone have a conflicting, uh, you know, this one, and we have to sometimes reduce the dose of Novax when using amidrone. So this, we need to keep into mind what other drugs are we using when we're using antiarrhythmic drugs, because many of them, you can have uh, what uh, interactions. Monitoring uh, antiarrhythmic drugs, as I said, the common used uh, class one, a, you know, and sodium channel blockers and potassium channel blockers can be monitored by basic ECG, especially when something changes in the patient, like you're adding new drugs or, you know, his increases or his developed CHF. So we can monitor with the QRS duration for sodium channel blockers and also the QT interval and for class 3 drugs, definitely the QT intervals. Toxicity, I think one thing that we need to really know is toxicity of amidrone. Although it's good, it's extremely, you know, it's got a huge side effect profile. It can affect almost every organ in the body. I'm not going to go through the details of this. And we need to give, we need to remember that we need to give amidrone only if it's absolutely essential and if there's no other alternative. So future of antiarrhythmic drugs. So many of these drugs are getting repurposed. Like quinidine is used in Brogada syndrome, idiopathic VK, VF, Perkinje triggered VF. Mexilitine is used in LQT2 because again, it can block the late sodium channels. Flaconide is used in CPVT, RVOT, VT, Anderson Travel syndrome. Ibutilide for atrial fibrillation. Ranulazine is used again. It can. It's a very selective sodium, late sodium channel blocker. It can. It is used in LQTs, AF, and ischemic. Maybe in ischemia related VF. And now the search is on for atrial selective antiarrhythmic drugs, which do not have under side effects on the ventricle. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Just see, I think we're running a little bit late. We don't have many questions in the 
half done by Manish. He has covered that also. So we are not probably running late. Okay. Okay. Great. Sir. So, so, sir. so, Mutha, only a couple of things that I wanted to say. It's important as a for the PGs to remember that these classifications are not absolute. It's the predominant action of the drug on the sodium channel, so it becomes class 1. Uh, it's a predominant action on potassium channel, it becomes class 3 drug like Sotalol. Amiodron, as you know, has action on multiple uh, channels, but predominantly a uh, class 3 drug. So that's what it is. And again, as uh, uh, Manish said, there is a specificity which we are trying to explore whether certain channels are more in the atrium and therefore you can make atrial specific drugs for atrial fibrillation. As Yash said, there is definitely overlap in the mechanisms and uh, arrhythmias. Uh, for example, we say that when you give extra stimulus, you initiate a re-entrant arrhythmia. But the same basal train can be a reason to increase calcium influx into the cell and incite a arrhythmia with triggered activity. Whereas it is said that to increase the possibility of initiating a triggered activity arrhythmia, you can do a burst pacing so that you induce calcium entry into the cell and lead to a triggered activity. But again, same basal train can lead to venke backing or a decremental conduction in a scar tissue and incite a re-entry. So therefore, there is a lot of overlap in our understanding. And these models are basically to understand how the arrhythmogenesis happens. We know in clinical situations, they may not be absolute. And the clinical experience also matters. The other thing is that to monitor the proarrhythmia, we have not been able to use therapeutic drug monitoring as in anti-epileptic drugs because the drug that is measured could be different and the active metabolite like in amiodron, it is desethyl amiodron, which may be measured. But again, the tissue levels and blood level is a different game. And therefore, therapeutic drug monitoring also doesn't help us to prevent the proarrhythmias as we might discuss in the next sessions. Hey, yeah. you want to... Thank you, sir. Um, Mani, sir, I, I think one of the drugs that we're using more and more these days are probably oral uh, mechanites. So just for the benefit of everyone here, um, how do you monitor the sort of, uh, you mentioned about QRS widening with flecainite. So how do you monitor that? Do you do that at baseline or do you do a treadmill because of the use, uh, use dependence? Just your thoughts, sir, because of people. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, it's a commonly used drug, especially for atrial arrhythmia. So uh, as you said, the monitoring would be, I, I would uh, generally monitor when I escalate the dose with an ECG to see whether there's any 25% increase in the QRS duration, and at which point I would prevent uh, further upscale or probably come down on the dose. And I don't routinely use uh, a treadmill because many of these patients can't go on a treadmill. And I use this monitoring only when I'm changing the dose or if there's a change, like what I said, if there's a change in the clinical situation, clinical condition of the patient, He's developed, uh, you know, increasing creatinine, or you know, we are adding some other new drug. Uh, you know, then in such cases, I would monitor, but not otherwise. So, Manish and Muthaya, would you want to discuss what is use dependence and reverse use dependence? Yeah, uh, this uh, sodium channel blockers, many of them have got use dependent. That means they are more active or more efficacious in tissues which are rapidly firing. For example, in an atrial arrhythmia, wherein the atria are firing very rapidly, a uh, use dependent uh, beta blocker would act, I mean, uh, sodium channel blocker would preferentially act on the atria, not on the ventricle. So the, uh, the other side is the class three agents sometimes have got reverse use dependent. So now we have to remember the class three agents uh, have got an undesirable effect of QT prolongation. Now, if there is reverse use dependent, that means they become worse when there is bradycardia. So many of these class 3 agents, you know, will cause more QT prolongation when there is sinus bradycardia. So, you know, it's very common practice to combine something like an amidolone or a sotlol with the beta blocker or something like that. And that bradycardia can potentiate the reverse use dependence of these drugs and cause more prolonged QT prolongation. So that's another thing, you know, drug-drug interaction that we need to keep in mind when we're using this anti arrhythmic drugs. As I said, you know, they're working on a very narrow therapeutic window and you need to be very careful when you're using them. Correct. So therapeutically speaking, the ability to prolong the refractory period is greater at faster rate with class yes, 1 okay. drugs. Therefore, they are more useful to terminate an atrial fibrillation, for example, because they would prolong the ref atrial refractory period more when the atrial fibrillation is on. Whereas Sotalol is more able to prolong the refractory period when the rates are slower. And therefore, it might be more effective to prevent a recurrence that is going from sinus rhythm to atrial fibrillation. So that's how the use and reverse use dependence plays differently when one talks of therapeutic effects. 
Okay. One one point regarding these uh, drugs and atrial arrhythmias is usually we combine them with some kind of AV nodal blocking drugs because they do affect the conduction uh, conduction in the in the um, because you, like sir mentioned that the conduction velocity within the circuit can come down especially with flaconite so we usually do combine them with um, small dose of beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. Yes, sure. Okay. I think we'll move on, sir. I think the yes. uh, the next next talk is by uh, Mukund sir and Manish sir together. <coughs> I think. Yeah. Anyway, I just yes, uh, want to make a comment, Muthaya. If yes. Uh, yeah. So inside. this uh, very pertinent question, what you asked, like uh, flaconide and checking its uh, effect on the uh, QRS duration. What, as Manishar said, many of these patients are often uh, not uh, very physically fit enough to do a treadmill. So what I sometimes do is just put a holter on and let them do their own activity. So at least during throughout the day, in the diurnal variation, when they, they are walking around or at least physically active in the sinus tachycardia zone, if the QRS is not widening, you can take it a relative a surrogate that, okay, you are, you are not in the toxic dose. Thank you. So we'll give it back to both of you, sir. Shannon yes. Yeah, so the next talk will be shared by me and Mukun. I'll just give a few introductory slides on proarrhythmia, and then Mukun will give some clinical examples. So, you know, what is proarrhythmia? Proarrhythmia is a new or aggravated arrhythmia that developed during drug therapy and usually clinically non toxic concentration. So, you're giving a standard therapeutic drug the dose, and you have, uh, you know, arrhythmic uh, worsening of arrhythmia. So the common drugs that are uh, you know uh, responsible for proarrhythmic effects are antiarrhythmics by obvious choice, and but surprisingly there are other drugs which can be proarrhythmic. So so if you think about giving erythromycin as an antibiotic and suddenly you see QT prolongation, or you give an antipsychotic or an antidepressant and then you have QT prolongation. So you know that's a dreaded complication, a dreaded proarrhythmia that we're all worried about. About you know the drugs that is cause QT prolongation in TDP. Why so many drugs like you know antimicrobials, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and many others can cause QT prolongation? So it's, under, it's understandable why a drug, cardioselective drug can cause QT prolongation, but why do these drugs cause QT prolongation? The problem might not be actually with the, you know, uh, the action of the drug, but might be because of the drug per se. So one thing that we need to understand is the Herc channel or, you know, the human agogo gene or otherwise called the KCNH2 channel. This is a common channel in the cardiac myocyte. Unlike other potassium channels, the pores in the Herc channel are huge. So what it, you know, by, by virtue of being huge, what it accidentally does, it traps a lot of unnecessary drugs. So you think about drug, giving a drug like erythromycin and imagine it being trapped in this channel and it will block the sodium potassium, sodium, sodium current. So it will cause QT prolongation. So, you know, many of these drugs that cause QT prolongation are, are causing QT prolongation by virtue of their size of the drug. And because the channel is slightly deformed and it is huge and it is traps a lot of drugs which are unrelated and do not have cardiac specific side effects. So and that's how many other drugs which are not responsible for cardiac effects cause QT prolongation. And thankfully, now all drugs that undergo development, you know, have to go, uh, undergo this, uh, you know, Herc gene uh, testing and have to make sure, you know, at the development phase itself, they see that how much effect do they have on this uh, Herc channel and do they, are they, pro, are, are they, you know, responsible for QT prolongation. So apart from that, the most obvious culprits are the antiarrhythmic drugs. Now, proarrhythmia, this due to antiarrhythmic, depends on the drug and the dose by virtue of the mechanism of the drug, like a sodium channel blocker can cause QT prolongation or a class 3 drug can cause QT prolongation. That's because of the drug and the dose that you give. But, you know, it also depends on a few other factors, like patient factors. Proarrhythmic effect is more common in women. You know, women have slightly more QT prolongation. And, you know, this why, you know, it's said that also, the, the, uh, you know, the androgenic uh, hormones are slightly more protective. So it's what is seen is women tend to have more proarrhythmia with this antiarrhythmic drug. So we need to be careful. Other things would be genetic factors, like, you know, metabolizers. We'll take, for example, uh, procainamide. Procainamide is, is, is it's not available in India, but it's broken down by acetylation to an active metabolite. So the there are again slow and rapid acetylators. So genetically, if you're a slow acetylator, you'll accumulate procainamide and you'll be responsible and you know, you'll have probably more uh, proarrhythmia. So genetic basis also, you know, is responsible for proarrhythmia. Another important uh, responsible, you know, feature for proarrhythmia is the comorbidities. Like many of these antiarrhythmic drugs, I, I did not mention in my last talk, should not be given in structural heart disease. So when you have severe LV dysfunction, you should not be giving, you know, in many trials, it can show that it increases proarrhythmia and mortality. So it should not be given. So same with severe LVH. 
you should not be giving a class 1a or class 3 a class 1c agent in severe lvh and in severe lv dysfunction and the other comorbidities of the patient may also uh, you know be uh, determine the uh, you know per pro arrhythmia like uh, renal dysfunction coexisting renal dysfunction or hepatic dysfunction which would make the drug, which would change the drug levels and make it more toxic. And the last and most important component of proarrhythmic risk is the concomitant medications. As I told that many of these drugs have got protein binding, have got first pass metabolism metabolized by the liver. So drugs that induce cytochromes, the drugs that inhibit cytochromes can potentially increase or decrease the level of these antiarrhythmic drugs and cause proarrhythmic uh, effects. So, you know, again, monitoring for proarrhythmia, as I said, would be by monitoring, uh, you know, by QRS duration and by QT prolongation. And uh, obviously, we need to avoid certain drugs in many of these drugs in uh, heart failure and in uh, flaconite, for example, in severe LVH also. And when there is QRS widening, already pre existing QRS widening, unless you have a pacemaker. And uh, similar with propofenone also. And uh, sotalol, because of its renal uh, clearance, should not be used in very, uh, you know, in CKD, etc. And we need to monitor for symptomatic bradycardia in most of these uh, patients and also for prolonged QT interval. <clears throat> so, you know, it's said to avoid 1A, 1C and class 3 drugs in patients with significant structural heart disease, including cardiomyopathy, left ventricular dysfunction, myocardial infarction and myocardial ischemia. Except for amidrone, donodrone, and sotalol, avoid use of class 1A, 1C and class 3 drugs in patients with severe LVH, more than 1.4. So these are the mechanisms promoting proarrhythmia, drug and substrate interaction, that is the underlying heart, whether this LV dysfunction or hypertrophy, drug-drug interactions, whether you're using an associated potassium channel blocker also, which can potentiate the QT prolongation, whether you're using enzyme inducers, hepatic enzyme inducers or inhibitors, and patient-specific uh, effects like female gender and obviously the underlying milieu, like ischemia, inflammation, hypoxia, electrolyte disturbances, all can change the electrical properties of the cell membrane and make a drug which was otherwise non-toxic, toxic. So we need to be careful of these things when dealing with proarrhythmia. Now I'll hand over to Mukun for the rest of the topic. Thank you, Manish. Uh, can you? Yeah, I'm sharing my screen. I'll be focusing mainly on the uh, proarrhythmic effects of anti-arrhythmic drugs in this uh, few slides. This is partly some overlap from what Manish has told. So I'll skip some of the slides in between. So Prorhythmia is defined uh, is a medication induced change in depolarization or repolarization phase of the membrane action potential and results in either a new arrhythmia or aggravation of an existing arrhythmia. And it's actually a not very rigorous definition because in, in practice it's not possible that it should happen at a non toxic plasma concentration of the medication. In practice, we definitely can't know whether it's toxic level or not in many of the drugs. So some of these ele uh, elements may actually be drug toxicity rather than uh, pure pro yeah. But for management wise, like in clinical practice, there's a significant overlap and we consider both of them clubs. So what all may be the likely factors? Dose, as I discussed, we are not sure. It should be a normal therapeutic dose as a definition. Then electrolyte imbalances definitely contribute, especially potassium and magnesium, which have high impact on action potential, phase three of the action potential. Hemodynamic instabilities, low perfusion can increase the half-life of the drugs like liver and kidney failure. So proarrhythmias may be more common even in therapeutic doses. And any other conditions affecting metabolism and excretion like coexistent use of other drugs. We're not going to you know, extensive details of this, but we know that drug-drug interactions can result in uh, increase or decrease in half-life. So always ensure dose is appropriate, electrolytes are normal, and consider effects of co-prescribed drugs when you prescribe any anti drugs. What are the mechanisms of proarrhythmia? Almost all mechanisms act on the action potential, some phase of the action potential. So enhanced automaticity affecting phase four, like in beta agonist, salbutamol or not. It's not an antiarrhythmic drug, but still it can result in tachycardia. It can cause sinus tachycardia. It can cause atrial ventricular ectopic, sometimes atrial fibrillation. And other drugs like class two and class four, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, suppresses automaticity acting on phase four and can result in bradyarrhythmia, usually sinus bradycardia, but can also uh, cause AV block. And more importantly, a block in phase zero of action potential in atrial as well as ventricular myocardium, uh, this sodium channel blockade, class one drugs, can cause significant and profound proarrhythmic effects that widen the QRS complex because of the sodium channel blockade. Please note sinus node as well as calcium, uh, AV node phase uh, zero is not by sodium channel, it's by calcium channel. So the effect is more on atrial and ventricular uh, myocardial action potential. 
then there may be changes in depolarization or repolarization difference between epicardium and endocardium is selectively enhanced or suppressed epicardial more than endocardium endocardial action potential or vice versa can cause a phase 2 reentry there's a reentry between various zones within the myocardium during phase 2 of the action potential classically seen bugala syndrome where you have a gradient between epicardial rvot and rest of the rv that triggers the reentry so some of the sodium channel blockers differentially suppress endocardial or epicardial and you can have this brugada syndrome like presentation as a prorhythmic effect then altered repolarization mainly pertains to class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs which acts on the potassium channel the phase 3 of the action potential they prolong the action potential duration and longer the action potential duration there's more cal uh, calcium inside the cell triggered activity and triggers a polymorphic ventricular arrhythmia and altered calcium cycling also can result in uh, intracellular calcium overload that is in phase 4 like in digitalis and you get delayed after depolarization so these are the mechanisms by which prorhythmic uh, manifestations happen this is a same thing summarizing picture form this is a normal ecg and normal sorry normal action potential you expect a normal ecg here when you have enhanced automaticity uh, this dotted line represents the normal action potential the solid one uh, represents enhanced automaticity and so on your result in, in tachycardia in the ecg usually sinus tachycardia but other uh, triggered activity like things can also happen and then and then sort of mask arrhythmia can also happen suppressed automaticity results in bradycardia usually sinus bradycardia but can also happen in uh, cause av block then slowing of phase 0 depolarization like sodium channel blockade class 1 and class c class 1 c and class 1 a especially causes qrs widening and this pertains mainly to myocardium and his perkinje system also on the atrial uh, musculature then comes triggered activity due to early after depolarization seen seen with drugs that prolong the action potential duration like class 3 antiarrhythmics you get qt prolongation in ecgs and you may also get early triggered activity causing ectopy and left side bottom this picture shows brugada pattern due to heterogeneous depolarization what you call as phase 2 reentry the mechanism here is phase 2 reentry and the ecg marker is a brugada pattern if phase 2 reentry happens you get a polymorphic qt and finally late after depolarization causing delayed after depolarization like in digitalis toxicity it mainly increases the calcium load of the cell and causes this prorhythmic effect you may get uh, a classical st uh, depression as in digitalis so moving on to individual class sodium channel blockers they slow the phase 4 of the depolarization primary effect is blocking sodium channel and slowing the phase 0 it has minimal effect on the healthy sinus uh, node but in a disease sinus node you may get profound bradycardia and at high levels of sodium channel blockers blockade the qrs duration prolongs this can be used as a marker to identify patients prone for this prorhythmic uh, effects the classes are actually class 1 a quinidine uh, procainamide and isoparamide commonly used one for us is disoparamide that itself is not very commonly used but that is the most likely available drug and class 1 c procainamide is very popular whereas propofenone is available to, but not as popular they are felt to be toxic if the qrs width has increased by 25% after starting the drug all you need to do is monitor ecg the tmp is even better because of already discussed phenomenon called use dependency i will touch upon it later and however these drugs are prorhythmic at any dose and should be used with caution we can't be very sure that okay this is therapeutic dose so nothing will happen it's not like that and using tmt for monitoring is preferable though not always practical because of the use dependence of property it's actually these drugs act better in active when the sodium channel state uh, sodium channel is in its active state so at faster heart rate more uh, sodium channel blockers that's why they can terminate uh, arrhythmias more effectively than amadorone which is a reverse use drug and at faster rates antiarrhythmic will be even more and the qrs will be wider so you make use of this phenomenon by making a tmt and seeing the qrs widens or not even during af you can see this phenomenon if you have faster rates the qrs may get uh, wider beats may be seen may think it's an aberrancy but also think about prorhythmic effect just a brief mention on class 1b manish has already made this point uh, actually it doesn't have much prorhythmic effects except in very high doses where it can cause bradycardia even before your uh, cardiac prorhythmic effects you get neuronal side effects so most of the side effects are actually drowsiness excitability uh, seizures depressed reflexes etc rather than a ecg change in class 1b is very popular drug lignocaine as well as mexilatine and it binds primarily when the sodium channel is inactive this makes it 
very uh, pertinent in the setting of acute ischemia because ischemic myocardium have inactive sodium channels. That's why, as Manish already mentioned, myocardial infarction, ventricular tachycardias, and arrhythmias, we prefer lignopin over emetoron. And the clinical tip is that because of extreme QRS widening from use dependence, differentiating from a VT or SVT with aberrancy can be difficult. So any wide QRS tachycardia in a patient on class 1 anti-arrhythmic drugs, class 1A or C, I always consider pro arrhythmic effects before uh, thinking that it's a VT. But treatment-wise, you just need to cardio You do not think and choose which drug to give. You just need to cardio when you have pro arrhythmic suspicion high on the uh, Sir, uh, sorry to interrupt. Another uh, three minutes, we need to wrap up this one, sir. And oh, then okay. we have a discussion. Okay, sir. Fine. I'll skip most of the slides. I'll just go to the clinical listing. So this is a 72-year-old uh, man with AF on flectonide. He came with this ECG. It shows that the classical type 1 Brugada pattern. After the drug was withdrawn, the ECG became normal. So if you continue, you may end up in a polymorphic VT. Get another person on a dual chamber pacemaker for AF, 6 sinus syndrome, on flecanide for paroxysmal AF, came with this ECG. As you see, QRS is remarkably wide because of the flecanide effect. After withdrawing the drug, uh, 24 hours later, you see this ECG. QRS is starting to narrow down. It's a phase rhythm now. Class 3 antiarrhythmics stretch the QT interval because of potassium channel blockade. Despite that, amidogen has a low pro arrhythmic effect, like 0.1%. And but still it can happen, like this lady, 62, 65 year old lady, developed this ECG after IV amidoron. The significant macroscopic D wave alternates, maybe underlying channelopathy is there, we are not sure, but it can happen occasionally. In yet another patient uh, for rheumatic MS and AF, he was on digoxin and amidoron, developed this arrhythmia. This is an early after depolarization. Very short coupled uh, ectopy and QT is long actually, but it's not impressive because you don't have consecutive sinus beats. And after the uh, drug withdrawal, a few days later, this is A6. So, clinical points on torsades higher risk when potassium and magnesium is low, more often in women, often post dependent. We'll explain in the next talk. DPC triggers it and temporary pacing can suppress it. We'll skip a few more slides. This is all uh, clinical practice tip. It has to be started in hospital basis for so at least three days. Patient need to be hospitalized ideally. Do not start it when it uh, QT interval is more than 4, 480. Keep potassium and magnesium in the target range and monitor the QT interval. More than 500 during initiation or 520 during maintenance, stop the drug. This is autolyl proarrhythmia seen in a patient in a lady uh, with AF. Uh, developed this ECG 48 hours after initiation of autolyl. You can see the remarkable QT prolongation. Digital I will skip. It's a popular drug, familiar drug, so I'll skip because of lack of time. Class 2 also. This is a clinical practice table. Uh, so how to monitor medications for pro effects. For beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, just measure the heart rate and look for the PR interval. For class 1A and class 1C, look at the ECG for 30% or more increase in QRS duration. Also for other bradyarrhythmia or AV blocks, conduction blocks. Then clinical arrhythmias that may result from pro effect is 1 is to 1 flutter, as well as wide QRS tachycardia due to SVT and uh, channel blockade, or VT per se. TMT can be a monitoring tool for pro effects. Class 1B, already mentioned, there's no much ECG changes you can monitor, just look at the heart rate. Whereas Class 3, look for brad arrhythmias as well as QT prolongation. Clinical arrhythmias that may result from pro effects is incessant slow VT. Well-controlled VT previously, on a medoran for months together, now presenting with a slow, incessant VT, not responding to anything. That's a classical pro threats, which is often overlooked. And digoxin, you have blood levels as well, apart from ECG. And note that digital effect is not a pro effects. effect. Only higher degrees of arrhythmia qualify as pro effects. effect. Treatment also will skip. And thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was a very interactive talk, uh, talk and uh, as both of you have uh, elucidated uh, with case examples, uh, can we have a couple of questions? Uh, if from the audience. There's a couple in the chat box, sir. Yeah. So uh, many of them I have answered uh, by text. So maybe we can go from down uh, and then we have a couple of answers. So what uh, what was the dose used in those cases where with the flaconite toxicity, sir? So Mukun, sir, uh, he's asking about one of a particular case. One case is uh, from uh, my Melbourne Times. I don't exactly remember the dose. A pacemaker patient. Okay. Uh, but the type 1 Brugada happened as therapeutic doses, 100 mg twice daily. So, uh, let me ask you one question. Uh, let's say the minimum starting dose for flaconide is 50 mg BD twice daily. Yeah. Have you played any time with this dose uh, having proarrhythmia or QRS widening? I haven't seen any, if any of you are Navarsar, yeah. 
Yeah, in adults, 50 mg I have never seen. And I hardly never use it beyond 200 mg per day. Though the recommendation is up to 300 mg. True, true, true. Correct. So we are not I able think the uh, rest of the questions we'll answer in the chat box. Uh, we can go to the next topic uh, to be presented by Mukund sir again. So it's a very interesting topic. Uh, polymorphic VT is over to you, sir. Okay. This also will make quick probably. Otherwise, I'll have to interrupt. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. We have uh, around 15 minutes you can take on that and then we can have a discussion. Yeah. Thank you, okay. sir. So polymorphic VT is a malignant ventricular tachyarrhythmia. With changing QRS we cannot see your slides. Sir. Your slides are not up, sir. I think the old slide is on. Yeah, yeah. Can you see now? Uh, not yet, sir. Maybe you have to reshare. I think stop share and reshare, sir. Now, I think yes, yes sir. we can see it, sir. Second slide here on this. Polymorphic VT is a malignant sort of ventricular tachycardia with changing QRS pattern that will either terminate spontaneously, causing syncope if it lasts for more than a few seconds, or may degenerate to VF and cause cardiac arrest. If it is very short, it may not be symptomatic at all. You may pick it up in halters without any symptoms, but a significant three, four second duration will translate to syncope, and longer than that, you can have sudden deaths. Often leads to arrhythmic storms. The behavioral pattern can be totally asymptomatic, incidentally detected short runs in halter, one time syncope, or a cluster of VF episodes causing arrhythmic storm if it survives or sudden death. Approaching polymorphic PT is important because it's a very heterogeneous in, uh, entity. Though the ECG qualifies as polymorphic PT, for management purposes, we have to look into many of the finer things. The basic first step is long QT, whether the QT is long in sinus beats or not. If it is, then it's called torsades de pointis. And if it is not, it's not called as torsades, it's just called polymorphic VT. And causes are very heterogeneous. Long QT as a basket of its own causes and uh, polymorphic VT happening with normal QT as a different set of causes with different treatment altogether. And some of them can be exercise induced like CPVT, which is a genetic thing, ischemic ventricular fibrillation in significant coronary artery disease. Patient may die suddenly during exercise and the mechanism will usually be ischemia induced polymorphic VT. And incidental polymorphic VT where we don't have any explanation or cause and you can't reproduce it in the EP lab either. And always take care to exclude mimicking things like artifacts, especially when you use a ICU monitor and atrial arrhythmia with ventricular pre-excitation where, where you can have significant beat-to-beat -beat variation in QRS morphology. And if there is no organic disease, the Brugada syndrome, short QT syndrome, idiopathic VF, J-wave syndromes and drug-induced polymorphic VT or differential diagnosis, all of this will have a normal QT interval. We'll just go into a bit more details of these, focusing mainly on torsade stay pointers. It's presence of congenital or acquired uh, forms of long QT syndrome. You may call it syndrome or not, but the QT interval will be long. That's the hallmark of torsade. And the QT interval in, in sinus syndrome is not always available. So after cardioversion, we have to see, or if you have older records, we have to compare with. And characteristic mode of onset is a hallmark of torsadis. The first beat of tachyarrhythmia is triggered by a uh, depolarization, triggered activity. And usually it is at least 450 millisecond after the last QRS, it's coupling interval, more than 450 or 500, two studies def defining it as 450 or 500, but anyway, more than 450 at least. The triggering beat will be related to the previous sinus beat by at least 450 milliseconds. And the abnormal QT fails to accommodate sudden heart rate changes. So the triggering happens when heart rate suddenly changes. I will explain on that uh, in coming slides. So there are two types of torsades. One is during sinus acceleration, and it's called tachycardia dependent torsades. And other is during sinus uh, heart rate deceleration. No, not the sinus deceleration. It's just heart rate deceleration. And it's called pause dependent torsades, of which pause dependent torsades is more common. I'll explain with examples. Uh, don't get confused. So pause dependent torsad is more common. Here a pause, usually either a sinus pause or one caused by an ectopy, results in a further stretching of QT interval. The QT interval is actually dependent on the rate of the previous beat. The longer, the slower the heart rate is, the longer the QT interval. So a sudden ectopy causes a pause that causes an enhanced or stretched QT interval, and that causes triggered activity and re-entry. So this short, long, short sequence is typically seen. So we'll go through the ECGs. Whereas in tachycardia-dependent torsades, which is usually seen in congenital long QT syndrome, infants and neonates, 
the heart rate actually accelerates sinus rate accelerates and because the qt is already long a further acceleration the action potential can't come down it can't shorten as in normal hearts because there's no channel to uh, shorten the qt interval potassium current is very low so what happens is qt stretches further you may even develop t wave alternance and eventually leads to torsades this is called tachycardia dependent torsades this is a classical uh, situation where you expect a tachycardia dependent torsades you get macroscopic t wave alternance you can see beat to beat how the t wave polarity not polarity depth changes as well as qt prolongs this means that you are already at the level stretched to the maximum whatever potassium current you have any further heart rate increase the action potential cannot shorten further and any small exercise uh, can trigger a vt and syncope as this app had as it happened in this 13 year old child so treated with uh, propellant and sympathetic denervation this is another example a 41 year old lady with dcm mind you it is dcm structural heart disease admitted with heart failure so here you have qt interval that's already long she also had hypokalemia and calcium intracellular calcium levels may go haywire in advanced heart failure due to any cause even in dcm it need not be channelopathy actually you need not even have potassium abnormalities you still can have polymorphic qt in this substrate but in this particular lady you can see pause dependent torsades here is an ectopy which resulted in a pause the qt interval significantly prolonged after that uh, for the next beat after the pause and that triggered a early after depolarization and polymorphic vt so this is the classical pause dependent torsades you have a short short because it's an ectopy long long because it's a post ectopic pause followed by a short so long short or short long sh uh, short sequence that ls is important sls or ls with long short sequence triggers the arrhythmia that's called pause dependent torsades is very uh, imperative you have to look into it because the treatment aspect is very different i will explain to that as well for that another lady 67 year old lady uh, with syncope recurrent syncope and you have to carefully go through the ccg because what we are seeing here in the first ccg on the left is there is intermittent av block here you can see a dropped t wave so the, probably this lady had a history of bradycardia since months that prolonged her qt and when you have a bijamal rhythm it's very hard to guess whether qt is prolonged or not so you have to uh, learn to recognize this pattern and these ectopics one of three of them triggered polymorphic qt again pause dependent mechanism here probably qt uh, prolongation can be better appreciated and note the qt interval change uh, driven by previous rr interval that is pause happens like in here the qt tends to be longer whereas in this speed qt wave is not as deep and qt is much shorter so this is again a classical example of pause dependent torsades due to acquired causes and this lady had intermittent av block vpc is in bijamini and ill sustained polymorphic qt she also had a history of syncope so this is a bradycardia induced qt prolongation here you just need to take off the pauses by putting a temporary or permanent pacemaker depending on what the cause is that will reduce the pauses and immediately relieve from syncope you can also suppress the triggering ectopies with beta blocker once you have the pacemaker in place so what are the causes of long qt syndrome one is congenital there are so many variants bradycardia induced drug induced hypokalemia is a very common cause it's many times under recognized and post mi most of us would have seen after a few days of mi you have very long qt intervals and stress cardiomyopathy also can huge qt cause huge qt intervals post tachycardia uh, qt prolongation is also a described mechanism so we don't often see it and food related typically grapefruit juice how to treat this uh, torsades common drug that may be given is magnesium and lignocaine also helps sometimes but in tachycardia dependent torsades beta blocker is the preferred choice like we do in long qt one syndromes so reduce that in, uh, increase in the heart rate that happens during exercise that itself will uh, reduce the qt uh, restitution and less propensity for arrhythmia if that is not possible you can put a pacemaker to support the heart rate and give the beta blockers further pause dependent torsades is classically response to pacing if there is no pacing available isoprenal can be given so it uh, sounds counterintuitive and correction of potassium and any other uh, drugs that can cause qt prolongation should be avoided sedation takes off the sympathetic drive has some role in electrical storms and in specific subsets like in long qt left sympathetic cardiac denervation to take off the sympathetic drive and icd when you have a cardiac arrest with no reversible cause now going moving on to polymorphic qt without qt prolongation mechanisms can be phase 2 reentry as in brugada or jv syndromes or the same phase 2 reentry can happen in acute mi at the height of st elevation when you have one region of myocardium injured and electrolytes cell membrane has been disrupted 
versus rest of the myocardium with a normal action potential. There you can have a phase two re-entry, so-called primary ventricular fibrillation. Once you revascularize, it won't come back. And short coupled ectopies that trigger VF. The reasons may be many, post-MI Purkinje fibers, so-called angry Purkinje syndrome, R on T ectopics due to any cause, like idiopathic ectopics from RVOT. Some of them cause syncope and sudden deaths. All you need to have is an ectopy that falls in the vulnerable phase of the ventricular repolarization. That is R on T phenomenon. And channelopathy is like short QT syndrome and CTVT. And unknown mechanisms like an idiopathic VF. Myocarditis, the tissue edema and uh, heterogeneity in action potential distortion. And rarely drug-induced like in azithromycin, which causes polymorphic VT without QT prolongation. I just uh, pass through a few examples before we stop this talk. There's an acute MI. You can see the ST depression. It's a lead to monitor. Uh, I got this ECG from Manish actually. ST elevation was in anterior leads. And the height of ST elevation here is ST depressed. So the depth of the ST depression, you have the onset of arrhythmia. This is a phase two re-entry. And you need to cardio it and revascularize as early as possible. That will settle the thing. In the patient, we don't have VF onset. But uh, ST is still elevated, came with angina, arrested in casualty. Cardioverted and RCA plasty was done. Post cardioversion had AF as, as well, an inferior wall ST elevation. But if you happen to capture the onset, the onset will be at the height of this ST elevation. That's a phase two reentry. Let's skip this slide. And this other lady, 29 year old lady with recurrent syncope, you can see that syncope is, sorry, VT is triggered by a very short coupled ectopy. The QT is essentially normal. There's no change in RR interval, cycle length. QT interval, TV morphology, just out of the blue, one ectopic has come, fallen on the vulnerable faces, uh, R on T, and degenerated to VF. Short QT, the definitions vary. Some people define it as 360. There are other defi definitions like 340 as well as 320. Another ECG from a 59 year old lady. Third day after primary PTCA, this was her ECG in the morning, and she later developed a VF. What you can note here is a very short coupled ectopy, again from the deceased Purkinje fibers, anterior wall MI, and this is a uh, recording of VF. One of these ectopics just triggers VF. I'll take another three minutes. Hope it's okay. And these ectopics are suppressed best with verapamil, quinidine, and also ablation. This is a Brugada syndrome. You can see the type 1 pattern, and in the EP lab, we could induce a VF, and this is a phase 2 re entry. It's also a response to isoprenaline, quinidine, as well as RVOT ablation. And lastly, this 29 year old lady was treated as a seizure disorder for long, and again, short coupled ectopics with normal repolarization. The normal beats are perfectly normal, there's no pause, there's no QT prolongation, and these, these PVCs alone uh, triggers the VF, and ablation will take care of them. Summary, we should know what a polymorphic VT is and how to identify it and differentiate it from artifacts. Try to define the mechanism. We have post dependency. In torsets, we have we have torsets as well as normal QT polymorphic VT. In torsets, it can be post dependent or tachycardia dependent. Uh, in normal QT substrate, we have definite entities. Common things that we are likely to encounter are post MI uh, ectopics. Then look at the QT interval, look at the onset when available, try to record the onset. If you have telemetry in your ICU, it becomes easy. Look for tr triggers, drugs, channelopathies, and ischemia. And if it's a long QTS and post dependent, try pacing plus beta blockers. If it's tachycardia dependent, go for beta blockers. And if you have a normal QT with a short coupled ectopic, try quinidine, ablation, with or without ICD later. And, and angry Purkinje syndrome happens in acute MI setting. Again, the mechanism is R on the ectopics. Ectopics come for, from Purkinje fibers. Same strategy again. An acute MI is phase two reentry. Just need to revascularize and give beta blockers. And in Brugada syndrome, again phase two reentry. Quinidine, isoprenaline, as well as ablation helps. And exercise induced form for unique forms. One is classical, one is CPVT. It can also be ischemic VF in elderly. And probably that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Wonderful talk, and, and the ECGs were also really nice. Um, uh, do we have any comments? I think Nambar, sir, and yes, sir. Um, no, not in the chat box. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there are a couple of questions now. Uh, so first question is, uh, incidentally detected prolonged QT interval in asymptomatic individual, how to treat? So, so incidentally uh, detected long QT, we have to define why the QT is long. 
we have to start with acquired causes. If not, think about genetic causes. And that includes genotype testing, metabol metabolite testing, uh, structural heart disease exclusion, everything. And treatment-wise, it depends on the QT interval assets. Any QT more than 500 has a very high uh, risk of arrhythmia. So I will be starting beta blockers if there are no other contraindications. And based on genotype, I will take a further call. And I will uh, ensure that potassium depletion states are avoided. I will educate the patient on that and also give the list of drugs need to be avoided. Yeah, that so is for that family member screening comes part and parcel of any QT prolongation. Yeah, there is a site that gives uh, idea of the drugs that are harmful for both uh, long QT as well as Brugada syndrome. So I think uh, that's easily available on the website. The next question is why grape juice causes polymorphic VT? Yeah, that's a still have to be answered question. Alkaloids in the grape juice are uh, thought to be inhibit uh, channels causing polymorphic VT, but there's no uh, big study in this. Mukun sir, I want to ask you something. So let's say you have a patient where you know that's a drug induced uh, QT prolongation. Yeah. The uh, you've pulled out the reversible agent, QT has come down, back down to normal. Do, do you further evaluate this patient? Do you do anything else for this patient? Do you offer uh, genetic testing or anything like that? Or do yeah, you just say okay. it's a uh, Very pertinent question. So I always try to compare with older ECGs, if available, as well as family members ECG. And uh, partial reduction in potassium current, like in long QT2 syndrome, where, where the mutation is not as strong, or there is a heterozygous mutation, you may have a partial reduction in potassium current, which will be latent. It's latent QT interval, QT syndrome. And you need a second trigger for the QT to uh, stretch out and bring uh, become floridly abnormal. So that situation always exists. And I always counsel the patient regarding the possibility of genetic testing, especially if they are young. But I've never done in my practice because most of the patients won't agree for that. So actually, uh, in addition to genetic testing, which is more feasible, is doing a treadmill test. If you see the QT is not shortening, uh, although they apparently are normal, but there is a non-shortening of the QT. That is one of a subtle marker that you might suspect uh, underlying QT. And then you insist the patient for a genetic uh, testing. That's right. Treadmill test as well as epinephrine challenge has been uh, used for uh, latent QT syndrome. But problem with that strategy is it works best for long QT1, where your QT interval is already uh, long or at least longish towards 480 or more. When you have 440, like long 52 situation, even treadmill as well as adrenaline challenge has limitations. I will still agree that it should be done, but uh, I won't be stopping there. There is a question which is uh, a little unrelated to today's presentation, but uh, um, I think it's clinically relevant and we have time. So what is a patient is having recurrent SVT in pregnancy and you don't have to, uh, you don't want to ablate or there is no option of uh, or the, this thing of ablation, scope of ablation, which are the best drugs you will use? Should I take a question? So recurrent SVT in pregnancy. So. Pregnancy, SVT in pregnancy. Let's assume uh, AVNRT in pregnancy. Should I take the question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir. So SVT, acute SVT in pregnancy, uh, you can always use adenosine. It's a relatively safe drug in pregnancy, as well as you can cardio it if needed. Nothing else is working. And for SVT recurrences, beta blockers, as well as calcium channel blockers, both can relax the uterus a bit and prolong the labor. But there should not be an immediate concern. We have to time it um, according to the expected date uh, of delivery. And both of uh, them work reasonably well. If not, you can also give flaconite, but I, I don't remember a patient who needed it. Always, Almost always beta blockers and calcium channel blockers help. And one problem with SVT in pregnancy is towards the end, when you have a gravid uterus pressing the inferior vena cava, uh, you may have a fall in cardiac output during SVT, especially when the patient is supine, and that can cause uh, cardiac arrest. There are case reports like that. So try to place them in lateral positions before you cardio or you, know, you treat them rather than keeping in supine positions. That's a great point. I think I'll add on to this. I had a, a specific ent encounter of a pregnant lady who had a recurrent VT first time detected in pregnancy. And uh, MRI suggested that uh, there is a scar in the crux region. So we in, in fact had to implant ICD, but she came with recurrent ICD shocks. So beta blocker, as you said, is the safest one we tried. Immunotarone is reasonably contraindicated. So in that particular case, and flaconide we generally do not give when you have a scar. So you had to use a sotalol. So that patient uh, improved dramatically with sotalol. 
and uh, is almost three years down the line. Uh, the baby also delivered well, and she is doing well. Just for a comment, okay. Just a single case. Nice point. So, there is one question, maybe the last one. Explain phase two reentry. So, any any comment on this? I think if uh, Dr. Shrikumar is there, he spoke on the mechanism. He can take it, or uh, any of you. Uh, uh, may I know the question once more? Sir, uh, phase two re-entry. Yeah, phase two re-entry like in Brugada. Uh, yes. I didn't understand the question. Yeah, the, the question is just uh, explain phase two re-entry in a simplified language. That's all. Well, then Manish, anybody can uh, quickly answer that. Uh, phase two reentry actually uh, was first described in Bugara syndrome probably. But it uh, what happens in it is during phase two of the action potential, okay, one region of the heart actually uh, behaves differently from rest of the region in very simple terms. Mm -hmm. To be specific, it, it has to deal with transient outward sodium current. So now epicardial, for example, in Bugada, epicardial RVOT has a different action potential. It has a dome in the phase two, whereas the rest of the myocardium doesn't have. This creates a voltage gradient and this can trigger a uh, triggered activity which degenerates into a ventricular fibrillation. So it's a heterogeneous skin action potential shape due to phase two abnorm uh, abnormalities in the phase two of action potential. That leads to re-entry. This is probably the simplest I can explain. Uh, Manish and uh, Mukund, uh, some remarks about the newer anti-tubercular drugs which are used in drug resistant TB, beta coiling, etc. They are also quite uh, torsadogenic. Uh, offhand, I don't have any remarks, sir. Yeah, even I do not have, sir. I think a lot, lot of drugs are there. I think better to look up drugs that uh, cause. But I think most drugs now, as I said, undergo testing and come with a disclaimer that they do prolong uh, QT interval. So we can be more you know, watchful at them, I think. That's right. You have to repeat the ECGs at intervals after these drugs are started. I had a patient who had myocarditis and as well as a tuberculosis and... Uh, that was torrid with these uh, drug resistant, uh, the newer drugs, bedaquiline, etc. They are very prone to uh, torsards, QT prolongation and torsards. Sure. So uh, maybe each one of you can offer uh, one comment on something that is not discussed or needs to be stressed up uh, before we uh, find off. Is that good, uh, Utaya and uh, Deba? Yes, sir. And thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to unlearn the relatively difficult and uh, basic topic. Yes. And such a wonderful learning from all three of them. So maybe one comment if you have something or... Uh... Yeah, my comment would be to look beyond amidron when using an anti drug. It's more uh -huh. abused than used, I think. <laughs> so there are many other alternatives which are more useful and maybe, you know, deciding, deciphering the mechanism of arrhythmia and using the safer drug would be more, work, more worthwhile. Yes, your comment is more valid in atrial fibrillation where clearly the guidelines are classified as uh, no or minimal structural heart disease. You can use class 1C drugs and uh, with uh, min uh, significant structural heart disease, we are left with amiodron. Sure. Uh, Mukun, anything from you? Yeah, my comment uh, would be uh, always try to delineate the arrhythmia mechanism before starting a drug. Uh, starting a drug is, should be the last exercise because most of the unstable uh, arrhythmias we cardio We did not give drugs at all. And whenever you are a stable patient, you have time as well. So think, delineate the mechanism, look for pro effects and contributing factors before prescribing one. Second will be polymorphic VT is very much ignored thing in clinical practice. Uh, most of the time we don't witness the tracing. Even if we witness the tracing, we don't uh, try to delineate or define the uh, onset of polymorphic VT and try to define the mechanism that caused it because treatment is also very different. Yes, very, uh, very much important what you said because many times wrongly the QT is not looked at and the matters get worse when you think that Padron will do the trick this time also. Uh, Mutaya, something from you? Sir, so one thing that I, I mean, um, I think Manish said, uh, showed that picture of side effects of amiodrone. I think it's, we see a lot of patients who are taking amiodrone, you know, for a very long time. So one thing to keep in mind is definitely to monitor the side effects of amiodrone. And second is the effects of IV amiodrone are often very different than the effects of oral amiodrone. And especially with the hypotension that IV amiodrone creates that often makes the situation worse. So uh, some caution when giving bolus doses of amiodrone, especially in the emergency room to sick patients. 
Correct. So it's a very fine line when you have a patient with heart failure who requires inotropic support as well as atrial fibrillation when they require antiarrhythmics because the inotropic drugs tend to be sympathetic stimulants and therefore proarrhythmogenic. And uh, antiarrhythmic drugs tend to have a negative inotropic action. So many times in the ICU, you have to walk a thin line uh, between uh, using these multiple drugs and find out what is good, whether cardiovert and restrict the antiarrhythmic drugs or uh, do a balloon pump, for example, and mechanically support the inotropy uh, rather than scaling up the inotropic drugs. So I think all of us have experienced uh, these situations. Deva, one last comment from you before we close. I think we are good to go, sir. Right. Okay. So thanks, everybody. Uh, as Deva said, it is truly a little uh, less discussed, difficult topic, but still useful uh, at least for the general cardiologist, uh, cardiology postgraduate, so that the scare of using antiarrhythmic drugs is lesser. Now that we have a lot many antiarrhythmic drugs available in the Indian market, Cordron we always had, but now you have flaconide oral, you have propofenone oral available, you have ibutylide intravenous, and you have sotalol already for a long time. So with multiple such drugs available, dofetilide not yet, procanamide not yet, uh, but diisopyramide is again available. So uh, the Indian market has these drugs, and you will you will may not be able to refrain. Uh, from them all the time or at least you might have to seek consultation with the EP but whichever way one needs to be uh, uh, fairly familiar with the use of antiarrhythmic drugs. I think I'll uh, seek this point to uh, to uh, complete today's uh, session. I think it was interesting and uh, we'll keep having them on the first Sunday of every month and uh, I think it should be educative from the postgraduate's perspective. Thank you very much everybody, every faculty for being taking time out on a Sunday. And uh, it's been worth it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you, sir. Happy Sunday. Thank you, sir. Thank you.